Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to FSU Coach Life. My name is Tim Baggers, joined with a special guest today, Dr. Peter McGahey from, well, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Peter. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, just tell us a little bit about who you are, where you're from, and, and what you're doing. Tim, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat about coaching. I'm currently the head women's soccer coach at St. Leo University, and my path has taken me, I've been really blessed and fortunate to be in, in a few places with some really wonderful people. Uh, I started my coaching career in Denver, Colorado. Uh, then we spent some time in Oklahoma. Uh, we came back to Denver. Then we made the trek north to South Dakota uh, in a college position. Then we made a trip just a little bit east in a, another college position at Minnesota State University. Then we traveled uh, a little bit further north to Michigan at Central Michigan. My root college roommate at the time said that I was on the trajectory to coach my way out of the United States so that I was on, on, a, on a way to move move further north. So then I, I took him at his word and a little bit more than a year ago, we relocated and, and are now coaching here down in uh, Florida at St. Leo. So it's been quite a journey. Yeah, and, and I'm hopeful that people watching, if you have questions, just put them in the chat box and, and we'll get them to Peter. But one of the questions I wanted to ask you about is, you know, this is an opportunity for all of us to learn from coaches who are in the field and have kind of lived their experiences moving constantly from, from spot to spot to spot uh, as a, a family man. Talk a little bit about the, the challenges and the rationale for moving and, and some of the, the realities of being a coach. I think the reality is, is that you are, or I am incredibly grateful for the love and support of my family every day. I think that the how many times have they've had to pack boxes, uproot, make new friends, adjust to a new school, uh, to continue to build resilience in their own lives is uh, incredibly humbling and rewarding as I pursued my passion of coaching and, and, and helping develop people. So I think that the reality is, is that the more supportive of your family support structure, um, it, it, it makes a huge difference because that's made a huge difference uh, for me because they are uh, priority one. Team McGahey is, is first. So the reality is, is I think sometimes with coaching is, is I've always looked at trying to find ways where my skill set and my talents can best serve the community, best serve the program. Some has been connected by gaining experience, taking on national level positions. Uh, some of it has been the simple ambition of I want to coach at a different program. Some has been the ambition that I wanted to coach at a division one program. And at some is um, you in, in coaching, there is a reality that sometimes that you need a position, you need a job and, and you're fortunate that and grateful that people will find you, believe in you and give you an opportunity. So we've moved for need as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I want to come back to that. But one of the things you mentioned was working in Oklahoma where you weren't working in a college environment. And so I wanted to ask kind of the differences you experienced working with with youth athletes versus quote unquote adult athletes in the college level? So I was fortunate that the first part of my career, um, I basically cut my coaching teeth in the nonprofit youth sector of club, club athletics. So I was the director of coaching at the Denver Soccer Club, which was the local club that I actually had played in many moons before as a, as a very young athlete. So, and then when we moved to Oklahoma, I was the director of coaching and player development. So we were supervising the player development programs, supervising the coaching education programs. So it's really dealing with the the athlete and, and the parents and the players. The difference is, Tim, is, is that you're dealing with people and young people on the different spectrum of where their uh, playing career is. When you're coaching college athletes, they are much closer to the end than they are to the beginning and their developmental needs are different. So coaching a six-year-old is different than coaching a 26 year old, but I still think it is a people business at the end of the day and a relationship business at the end of the day. And really, if you're in it for the right reasons and aspiring to have those people reach their highest levels, you're always driven as a coach to to find what works works best for them. Can you talk a little bit about um, working with parents? Do you, do you have the same pressures with parents at the college level compared to uh, youth? I think that they're different. I think philosophically, I've always taken a mentor of mine, introduced this concept with parents for me years ago. He introduced the idea that parents should really be your partners, that you should be partnering with parents, that you should be collaborative 
with them, that you should be communicating with them, that you should be educating them, that you should be helping them understand the beauty of sport, what sport can teach their child and how their children can grow through their sport participation. I think at the youth level, you have some of the similar experiences that we have at college. And I wish I could tell you that all of the pressure with, with parents goes away at college. But I think over the years, you become a little bit more um, savvy at communicating with the parents, a little bit clear with expectations, but, but the challenges still persist. Um, parents want to know why their players, why, why their child is playing. They want to understand what their role is. And sometimes if they don't get those answers from their child, they, they come looking to you as a coach to, to provide that. So I, I think as you, you get into the college ranks, um, you're trying to help the parent transition their child into the adult world. So how we communicate with them and how we share those, those sh thoughts and perspectives to create those buffers and to have those players take a little bit more ownership in their own development, I think is really important. But I, I've always tried to be a, as collaborative and, and, and a good partner with the parents because nobody loves their kids like a parent loves their kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you say you, you like partnering with parents. What does that look like in a, a real world setting? Do you, you know, are, are they volunteering? Do you ask them to do things or, or support you in a specific way? How does that actually look? I think that some of that is, is that that's a place where that can vary based on the level of the kids. Like the parents of a U6 player or a U10 player are a little bit different than my parents at the college level. And then there's some eerie similarities. Like, so for example, at the little ones, when you're coaching little kids, you want the parents to bring snacks and everybody really loves the Rice Krispie treats at the end. And everybody loves to eat the oranges at halftime. Typically those are the parents bringing that. At the college level, Sometimes at the levels where I've been, the best fellowship has been developed between the coaches and the, and the parents and the players by the parents providing a potluck, potluck. So it's the family's best recipes post game to eat and build fellowship. And I think that, there, that there's real similarities. I think it's a similarity about trying to now, how do you communicate what your expectations are, what your goals are, what your visions for the program are at the varying levels has to obviously match the varying levels, but that, that type of consistent communication and, and a humble spirit as a coach, I think goes a long way to building mm -hmm. that, that, building that relationship with those parents. Mm -hmm. Well, just a reminder, if you're watching live, be sure to ask questions in the chat box. We'll get them to, to Peter. One of the questions I had, and this is, this is a hard question, and, and I don't like asking these questions, but we have to because we want to learn. When you're in an environment, you can't always be successful. Right, you're, you're not necessarily put in a situation where, although you want to be successful, you have the resources or the talent or or everything to be successful in a a win loss column. And I'm not talking here about developing athletes and 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 people. I'm talking about you're a college coach, and a lot of your job is built on a win loss record. Correct. And and it's hard sometimes. You know, fifty percent of of teams are you know under five hundred. You know, so. As, as, a, as a coach who's kind of gone through some of those experiences, you know, tell us, tell us realities of what it's like to struggle with a team who may be not as successful as you want them to be. And, and as a consequence, you get heat from the administration because you're not, not as successful as they want you to be. Well, I, I, would, even, I would even say, Tim, I, I certainly think that these are the kind of questions that in the coaching community we need to discuss more. Because these are the reality. Because the, these are the realities of what we're facing, and as you continue to advance up, the win-loss record uh, matters. It matters more. It's a really clear evaluation of did this go well? Did this not go well? And there's a hundred reasons why sometimes seasons don't go well or not. And I think it's just a place of we being able to talk about that. Like you said, heat from administration. I, I'll say to you is I got packed up and moved out. Like so, I, I, I think that that's a place of where. Um, you just have to you have to recognize that that's part of the process. I think that that's a place of where you have to recognize as a coach about what are the things that I'm in control of, right? The reality is, is as a co as a coach, I'm a hundred percent responsible for the outcomes of my team, whether that whether they're things that I'm in control of or where I'm not. I actually, whether it's my fault, I'm actually one hundred percent responsible. And I think it's really important as coaches to recognize that that level of ownership is important. 
there's sleepless nights, there's sleepless mornings, there's long runs, there's long bike rides of where you're constantly reflecting on how do you try to communicate better with the players? How do you communicate to build better relationships? How do you try to draw better performances out of them and the team? And sometimes no matter how much best intention we have, sometimes it just, it doesn't work. And I think that's a place where I've grown through those struggles. And I, and I, and I came into the college game to be fair, sort of on a utopian player development, everybody it's, it's, it's not about winning. It's all, you know, winning is winning is great and it's awesome, but I'm going to develop people and I'm going to develop players and I, I, and I'm going to be a good person. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and still at the end of the day, sometimes that those seasons and those situations can sometimes unravel um, and in, in a way that, that, that you would not want. But I, I think you learn a lot through those experiences because it's very similar to the, the players. You have to dust yourself up. You have to believe in what you do. You have to draw some really powerful lessons. And, and most importantly, you have to take responsibility and you have to say, yep, that was that, that, that was how that season went or that's how that time went. And, and what, what, how can I learn and how can I grow from that? I, I appreciate your honesty. You know, it, it, as you said, I think it is something that we need to talk about more because coaches go through a lot of, I would say, emotional trauma as, as coaches, whether it be in the heat of a, a game or match or whether it be on the outside. Once, once that match is over, dealing with sometimes the fallout. If you, if you kind of think back to... To those situations where you've you've had a tough loss or a bad season or or maybe you've been told you know this is this is not the place for you anymore you know how do you how do you control the narrative with your family in in a way that i i can't speak for you but i take those kind of things very personal right it's it's an attack on you know everything that i've done and i'm being told that it, it failed how do you then kind of almost compartmentalize that and not put it on your family when you go home because you're constantly thinking about your, your responsibilities. Uh, I, 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 that I, 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 wish, I, I could say, I could say to you is, is that my hope is, is that I've been a role model for my family about how I, how to handle adversity. Mm. I think that the, the tears and the investment is real. Like they've invested in the school there. You walk home and they're wearing the school, Again, there's a free, there's a, there's a lot of free t-shirts in coaching to be fair. So the, they're wearing the school colors. They're invested in those things. They've invested in your team. So they're hurting too, is what you're saying. They're hurting. Like it's cause then again, if you, if you, if you invest as a coach, if you invest in your team and they're building the team, at least the way that I've always strived to build it, that the family, that the the players are coming over for dinner, your your parents are around them. Some of it is, is that those are your players again for my, my kids have grown up idolizing. Like they have grown up and said, I want to be like the dad's players. I want to be like this player. And they've run into them at basketball games and the shopping mall and, and all of those things. And so that they, they and all of a sudden now it's, it's, it's over. And I think that, that you, that you're, you try to not bring those things home, but un, un, undoubtedly you bring it home because everybody looks around and goes, I guess nobody they, they don't want to see her anymore, which is okay. And that, and that's certainly people's choice and prerogatives, but I think it's how we choose to respond to that. And I think it's a place to, the, the lessons of how, how do you be a good role model for your family? I really, I really tried that. How do you respond back to adversity? And, and, and uh, that you could probably ask them is my hope is, is that, that I responded and it was a good role model as, 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 as often as I could. And I think it also it reminds me that the one conversation I shared with them was, is things are impermanent. Tim, I think in, in, in coaching that we get this idea that it's it's really our team. It's the team of the players. It's the team of the organization. It's those things that never is mine. Like it's not mine forever. I think that there's a reality with coaching that that understanding the impermanence of coaching and impermanence of teams. It's one of the things I think that makes it makes coaching beautiful, right? That it's impermanent, that we have a season. We can go through this. We have all these goals and visions. We achieve them or we don't. And then guess what? We get to start again. But sometimes the impermanence of coaching is, is we have those goals. We have those visions. Things don't go the way we want. And then really, guess what? It, 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 it's over. And now the direction that it, it chooses to move could be with or without you. And I think that, the, the, that trying to role model how to respond to adversity in life appropriately has been something that I've really tried to do and to teach the lesson of 
that life is impermanent. Life, the, the, the precious moments of lives and teams and those things, they have a life cycle and nothing lasts forever. Yeah, I, I once heard a coach talk about this and, and just kind of say, go in with the assumption that at some point you're going to be fired. Correct. And, and you know, don't just assume that every year is, is going to be a better year upon a better year upon a better year. Everybody gets replaced at some point. And that's that's a hard concept to accept. I, I think it is because we're as coaches, we're invested in our people. We want to see. I think it's when we believe when part of our role as coaches is to recognize recognize that players have limitless capacities, that li they have unlimited capabilities. And it's a lot of things work against that. But as when we tend to believe in our teams and believe in that they can grow, we're always sort of looking for that one more place. Like I think it's a place where some coaches, and I've always looked at it as you're playing an infinite game. Like again, there's a lot of literature out that now about are you playing a finite game or are you playing an infinite game. And I've always looked at sort of like it's infinite game. We can always get better. We can always do a little bit better every time. And I think that sometimes is, is, is when you believe in people, when you accept their unlimited capabilities, when you're trying to inspire them to be more responsible, more accountable, um, I, I think that sometimes that, 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 that's, a, that, that, that's a hard challenge because those things sometimes do run out. Sometimes they, 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 they take a course and, and, and it just doesn't go, it doesn't go as expected. And again, it's a little bit like if you have an Olympics, I was, I'm not, I've not been fortunate enough to coach a team at that level, but th th there's a clock. There's a clock on that process. There's a clock at competing at that highest level that, that doesn't go beyond that path. So you really got to, I think, really count your blessings, be grateful for what you've had, be grateful for how you've learned. And really, if, if you believe it, like the journey, the, 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 the obstacles, the way, the, the struggle is in the journey, um, then, then, then some of the challenges and difficulties um, they, they, they're, they're par for the course. They're, they're what's expected. You don't expect them. You don't really want to be having a conversation with your kids on the couch. Not, nobody gets into coaching to have the, kid, the conversation with your kids on your couch of, hey, uh, uh, the, the, the news article is going to break this afternoon. They don't really want us anymore. And we're going right. to have to, and we're going to have to figure something out. Nobody gets into coaching for that. But mm -hmm. I think is, is that if we want the, if we want all of the, 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 the glamour of subway sandwiches on buses and, uh, lots of lots of lots of flights where people are climbing over us. We somehow we sometimes have to accept, Tim, that sometimes that, that with 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 those with those really ultimate success moments comes some uh, real challenging and 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 challenging hard times. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say don't knock Subway because that's what my kids want every time we travel. So uh, Subway, if you're watching, you know, sponsor FSU Coach Live. Why not? <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely. One of the questions I had coming up next, which is preempted by somebody online, was talking about culture. And they asked, what are the things you would want people to see about the culture you aim to create? And what has and hasn't changed about that culture over time? So what, how do you describe your culture? And then how has it changed over, over time? And what hasn't changed? Ooh, I, I think the, I guess what hasn't changed over time is, I, I think it's simplified over time. You're trying to find a way that you're 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 delivering uh, a simpler, more clear message to people about what you're what you're doing, what you're striving for. But I think it's for me as 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 I've sort of trying to hone in on in this day and age with so much information and so much things with players, they can get so much stimulation and I information from their phone. We really have to if we really want them to. Uh, hone in on to what our culture stands for. You have to really talk about a couple of things for me that has grown. One is, is that I really believe that culture nowadays is co-created. It's something that now I, as a coach and as a coaching staff, have to co-create it with the players, that it has to be uh, recognized that everyone in our team, in our culture, has an invested interest in shaping it, growing it, and creating it. And that, I think, is has always been sort of something that I've believed, but over the last several years has really become more important. And then I think it's just breaking it down into a couple of things. One for me is we is greater than me. It's always about the team. The next one is, is it's about grit and hard work that you have to be a gritty, hardworking kind of team and culture that you have to embrace the concept of continuous growth, even for, even when the good times and even when the hard times, and then you really have to go about loving people and, 
sometimes that that love is a little bit love tough, but I think it really has to be, we have to say out loud more that it's okay to love each other as human beings, to love each other about everybody's capabilities and really love that uh, we, we want to see that we want to see people reach their re, reach incredible heights. Hmm. Now, going back to, to kind of more of the, the day to day of, of your job, obviously we're in coronavirus and that's changed everything for us right now. But if you think back to last season, for example, what, what would a typical day look like that wasn't involved in a competition? So a, a, a Tuesday, for example, talk us through kind of what you do on a day to day basis. Uh, I, I think that there's a, a there's a place where you're trying uh, you're trying to have as much structure and purpose as your day as your day as your day allows. Um, again, uh, with change to moving to Florida, I found that the 25 minute podcast on the way to work has been quite uh, qu quite good. Um, and I think just a little bit of sort of that continuous sort of reflection, quiet time in my own head. Then we're fortunate uh, here at St. Leo that we're able to have have some beautiful facilities where we're able to practice in the morning. So we go right in and that what that means is is that we've planned the practice the day before but i'll i'll fast forward to that in a second so we really try to start the day right away with training and some of that is is that we feel like if you can compartmentalize the day for the student athletes at the college level you get better focus so they're able to wake up eat hydrate come to practice invest in practice invest in what we have to do whether it's on the field a little bit of video and then they can go about and start their day so we're right on the field right away in the morning um, to, to impact and, and to positively shape the team and the culture. And then really then, Tim, you then move into the, during the season in terms of sort of all of the other off season, a little bit of the other responsibilities that we take as the coach, the management, the budget, the planning, the travel coordinator, the fundraiser, the, the, the communicating with the student athletes about what, how their academics are going or how they're going at home sort of. So you take all of that sort of other management areas and you tackle those um, not right after practice you always got to try to unwind a little bit of practice and, and fit your exercise in there um, and then you come back in in the afternoon and then we spend a lot of time trying to plan practice so what does our practice look like how are we building the culture how, how are we translating what we want onto the field into practice i think somewhere along the way i read that john wooden plan basically planning practice took as long or not longer than practice and I would say that that is entirely uh, reflected in our staff. We try to meet as a staff to break down the previous practice, plan the next one, just to make sure it's it's best preparing us. And then you're back sort of to those other uh, other responsibilities. And then in the afternoon, in our business, it's about recruiting. So it's about returning text messages. It's about setting up phone calls. It's about creating uh, meetings and those things. And then that's driving home. And then in the evening, it's now come home and Try to be connected to go to another soccer game that your daughter has to be playing in drive to a base lesson um go for a go for a bike ride uh, try to fit in date night that seems to be like this wonderful thing like i think we've had a lot of date nights haven't we and somehow that that's really hasn't been scheduled as often as probably others would like but you're trying but you're trying to work that family time in uh in in the evening around that and really trying to I would say even as I've gotten better older to try to be more compartmentalized with that because it's way too easy nowadays just to be on our phone, one more email, one more mm -hmm. phone call. Um, so that's, I would say that that's what a, what, what a typical day looks like for us. And when it comes to recruiting, do you specifically target uh, players that fit within a specific playing philosophy or a, a kind of personality? or is it more about who's the best player available? How do you find those players? And what are some of the ways that you recruit? I think that we're, I guess I would say that as, as somebody has said the question back to the culture, what has changed? I really think that this is a place with recruiting that you're really now looking for people, good people first. You're looking for that there, there's a level of talent that's required to play at whatever level. Again, I think the other day on the interview when I was listening to Coach Niles with FSU, uh, beach volleyball, I believe she was talking about the talent level that was required at her at her level. I think mm -hmm. at my level that there's a talent level required. So that there's sort of that's almost a a constant. Like you have to dig in and you have to find that talent. But the variable really start begins to become the character of the people. And really, we want to fill our program with good, committed people who are passionate about their soccer, passionate about life, passionate about growth and learning. So you're really targeting 
you're targeting targeting good people first because we just spend so much time together that again uh, one bad apple can spoil the bunch and you spend a, you spend a lot of time putting out fires with some of those things maybe maybe could have been headed off in a different way and i think that that's something that has ev evolved uh, evolved for me over the years then as it relates to now as we're going out and we're scouting and we're recruiting and we're evaluating players absolutely there are some things that we're really looking for to play a particular uh have a particular playing identity and that there's some talents and skills that we're looking for in potential student athletes to, to match that. So we really try to be clear when we're evaluating so that when they get here, they have the capabilities, they have the transferable skills that we've identified. And now we're able to hit the ground running with uh, uh, playing the way that we want to play. Now you have a team that's larger than 11 and it, it would be very, or, or, 14 depending on subs and, and so on and it would be it would be great if it was everybody starting and uh, you all have positions that you want to play in and we're all happy here but but that's not the case in in any sport really it, there's players who are starting and there are players who are not and there are players who are kind of somewhere in between where maybe you will start or maybe you won't how do you ensure that the players who are maybe on the bench this year or the players who think that they should be in that you know midfield position but you decide they're not ready or, or not as good as this other player right now how do you deal with some of the um, i'm not going to say drama but contention that might exist in those roles Ooh, wow if anybody in the chat box has any really really great suggestions we're always always as coaches always look looking to uh, looking to grow and pick up new ideas I, Tim this is I think is 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 a tremendous challenge for all coaches at all levels right I think it's players want to play but I think more importantly players want to feel valued mm -hmm. they want to feel they want to feel positive that they're positively contributing for who they are and I think that that's one of the things that we've really tried to stress in our culture, that who they are, what they do is not who they are. So that we don't want to define players within our program, whether they're the starting left forward or the starting right fullback, that we want them to be the authentic versions of themselves and showing up and helping co-create our culture, our a competitive culture, our positive culture, our culture as best as they can. And really stressing the idea that everybody is shaping and owning that and being unhappy or not satisfied with where you are, that's okay. But how you go about communicating those things or sharing those things, it's much different is as a player on the bench who can be standing, cheering and supporting your teammates deep down inside could be as uh, disappointed and as upset with her role as the player who is sulking and bad body language on the end of the bench and never high fives anybody. So it, it's really about recognizing that can you create an opportunity within your culture to value people for who they are and not what they do, and then be willing as a coach. And again, I think this is a place where we're always growing. And I know that this is a place where I'm still growing today is being willing to have uh, honest, transparent conversations about players, about where their role is, where you see their role, how they fit, and how they fit into into the into the vision of the team that should be co-created with the team that they were part of creating the vision and now if they're on board with that vision creation sometimes is is that we get to sit in this seat sometimes we get to sit in this other seat but if i'm on board with the vision and i've had a i've had a say in creating it i should be able to I, th there's there's a level of acceptance i believe that, that players will accept those hard situations. Because you're 100% right. On a, on a typical women's college soccer team, we could have somewhere between 25 to 30 athletes. Mm -hmm. And in a given season, about 18 of them will play regularly. And how many of them would have scholarships? So this is a little bit of a difference. So at the Division I level um, with women's college soccer, a fully funded uh, Division I women's soccer team has 14 scholarships. A fully funded Division II women's soccer team has 9.9. .9. So there's a difference between the two levels. And now within a team, you could have some people on uh, more money than others. You could have some people with greater role than others. And I think that that's a place where you try to do your best in the recruiting process to convince players and parents to really sell the authentic you of saying is like, 
people's value is not determined by their scholarship level. The scholarship that we may be offered to you is what we're afforded and allocated by the university, but your value to us as a human being and as a player far is far greater than those scholarship levels. And those things go hand in hand. And, and the concept of affordability, let's be fair with what's happening with Corona and, and universities as a whole, the concept of affordability is gonna become uh, greater and greater, Tim, over the over the next several years as 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 the economy rebounds, so I, I expect some more of those more of those challenges in the future. Another question came in. It says, "What are the one or two th two things that you've been able to get to during COVID nineteen that didn't necessarily make the cut before then that you're going to make sure you keep in your routine or prioritize?" Ooh. Um, I think it's two things I think is, is there's a place I think sometimes where as a, as a coach, you're always learning from a soccer standpoint, but I would say that during this time where you've sort of been away from the game, that there's a, a, a self-reflection on our coaching, on our coaching model, on our soccer model, are we delivering that uh, soccer model the best? And I think then the second piece is in terms of the prioritization, um, we, we were fortunate that we, we, we've, we've really invested in our mental skills training uh, since we've been, we, we've been apart. And I think that that's even something that I've gone through that program with the players. And that's something that you, you always wanna be, be reflecting on those things and growing in that way. And I think those are two, two areas of soccer growth and then a little bit of performance and mental skills, even as a coach that I've been able to invest in uh, since we've been uh, quarantined or social distancing or whatever, 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 whatever term we want to use today. Now talking about your, your coaching and, and kind of that quest for continual improvement, you talked about infinity, right? In that yeah. we can continue to get better. What are some specific ways beyond the, the couple of things that you mentioned there where you make sure that you are getting better and, and improving year after year after year? Um, I think, I, I, I guess I would say I've taken uh, two routes. So I've gone the route of uh, formal education. So I've gone back and gotten a master's degree in, in coaching education. Then I went on ahead and got my doctorate degree in educational leadership in that constant quest of, are you growing as a leader? Are you developing as a leader? Are you recognizing that there is more information to know? So that's one. And then within the, within the soccer realm, there's twofold. One is sort of personally for me, and some of that is, is that my investment with things through US soccer. I've been fortunate that I've been on their scouting staff for several years. I was involved with ODP, the Olympic Development Program for a number of years. And and then again with coaching education. And that's just a place where I think as coaches is, are we taking ourselves outside of our comfort zone to work with different players in different environments to be able to force our philosophies and our teaching and our style to adapt and to grow? Because everybody sort of works in it in a little bit different way. So are you, are you sort of are you putting your money where your mouth is? Again, back to this role modeling piece. Are you, if you're asking the players to get outside their comfort level and grow, are you as a coach stepping outside your comfort zone and finding different places to do that? And then I think it's just a place where on a daily basis and or on a regular basis, am I reflecting on my own coaching behaviors, my own coaching ideals, what I believe, what I don't believe. And some of that is, is asking the staff, asking the players, asking myself, and, and looking at trying to draw in and pull pull from other places and other uh, other areas um, that that you may not you may not even know. One of the examples I gave I, I gave my staff we were talking this week is about this idea of changing coaches or changing new people. Like in the NFL, they they bring in a new staff and they get more time with their athletes. And and I happen to be a Broncos fan, living in living in. Florida. I'm sorry. So I know I apologize. It's okay. <laughs> We had some good years, Peyton Manning and John Elway, so we, we fall back on those regularly. So, but the but just the just the piece about the coach made a point about that it, it's a little bit overrated about bringing in new coaches and those things because it's still the game and the teaching that's required about keep, keep, teaching a common language and having an identity and being clear with that. I think that that's something over the last several years that I've really tried to dig into more of simplify what I'm teaching, create a better playing identity. So the players have a better understanding about how we're having them develop, how we're helping them grow, and more importantly, how we're 
how we're wanting to compete. Hmm. One of the guests that we that I had on a couple of weeks ago was, was just talking about the the importance of loving what you do, and, and he was categorical that if you don't love your sport and coaching, then don't do this because it will burn you out. You will you will end up hating it and. A lot of negatives will come about. It has to be something that you're extremely passionate about. Talk a little bit about some of the challenges. So if I asked you, what what's the hardest thing for you as a coach, what would you say? I, I would answer, go back to where the conversation started. The, 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 the time away from my family, that if I was in a nine to five job and I could leave that com completely at the door. I could show up, I could take off my shoes and I could, I, I could walk in there and I could leave my briefcase or whatever those things at the door. Um, it, it would be is the, 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 the time that I know that I've missed. That's, that's, the, that's by, by far and away, I think that, that, that the hardest. But I think it's, it's, it's the passion piece about this, Tim, I think is as if you, 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 you've done a lot of research on burnout, right? Like burnout with coaches and that's a really important area for you. And I think that that's a place where I, I think we as coaches would, would have to admit that we, we burn the candle at both ends a lot. And I think it's both ends on two things for me. It's the passion that you have for your sport itself. And it's the passion that you have for the people who are involved in your sport. So you're now burning that candle from both ends. And sometimes this one is like the, the sport part of this is like on fire. You've recognized that whatever you're doing is not working and you have to pay a lot of attention over here only to recognize that this flame of the people, why is that going out? Why is that not working? So now you're trying to balance out those two, balance out those two ends because both are demanding. Both, both demand your attention and your understanding and your knowledge. And I think that the passion comes from it as a whole, where I have found myself to have a better understanding is I love soccer and it's fantastic, but I love helping people. I love, I love serving people. I love guiding people. My classroom, my thing happens to be soccer and happens to be coaching. And I think that's a place of a better understanding myself and what my pa where my passion is with that has really been helpful for me because I'm, I'm not all about the soccer all the time. And I'm not all, and, and, I, and I sort of gear towards making it sure it's about the people and, and, and being and using soccer for that. And, and just kind of, I, I want to be sensitive to your time and, and, and wrap up. If we look at, at coaching as a whole and, and your experiences as a coach, what advice would you have for people who are interested in getting into coaching, but also people who are interested in getting better as coaches? Wow, getting in, getting better. I, I almost would want to say it's a couple of things. It's maybe five things, right? I think that there's a place of where to recognize that you have the cap capability to learn, right? Like, so um, I think a lot of people who are passionate about their sport will be people who maybe have never played their sport. Like I will, I've never was fortunate to play my sport at, at a professional level, but I competed at the college level. But some of the best coaches I know didn't play at a very particularly high level, but they're really recognized that their capability to grow as coaches. I think then the other pieces is that are you accountable to yourself to grow and to put in the experiences that you have, then to recognize that you are responsible for your growth and development. And I think that's a place of where if you're looking to break into it, just accept the responsibilities. I think a, a great example was what, what you, one of your guests the other day gave the example of if people re reach out and network and they call and at the end, of, at once you pick up the phone, there's no plan of attack in terms of how you're trying to draw and learn some of these lessons. I think that that's a, just a place of where you're, you have to accept responsibility for your learning and growth. And then I think it's a place of where if you're looking to break in, if some people have said it's a network business, I think it's a people business. If you're passionate about what you're doing and you're willing to be responsible and put yourself into some really good growth places, you'll have the ability to learn and grow. And then the most important part I think for me is, is are you vulnerable? Are you human beings? I think that we, uh, we, we are working in sport and coaching is one of the, is an incredible gift. And we as coaches have really been, it's people, it's really cool to be called coach. I get it, but I'm, 
but we're all human beings. We're not infallible. We don't have all the answers. And I really think that that level of vulnerability and that level of humility to say is that I can always grow, that I can always get better, and I can always put myself in situations and around people to find new ideas, to find new things, to inspire my people better, I, I think is, is, is really important. So I guess if, if I was giving advice to my younger self who thought, thought I could conquer the coaching world, it would be is be vulnerable, be humble, work hard, put yourself around as good of people as you can, and, and accept full responsibility for all the things that you're doing. And at the end of the day, really love what you do. Thank you. I, I uh, will also state that, you know, you came up to meet me several months ago and that's why we're having this conversation. And it required that ability to, Hey, come, let's have a conversation rather than assume that people just come to you. And, and sometimes we, we think, well, if we're successful, people come to us that, we're forgetting how we got there in the first place, which is us going to other people and saying, we need to learn from you. We need to learn from you. We need to learn from you. And if we don't, if we lose that, sometimes we can then get that, that kind of seniority complex or that ego complex of, well, I know everything now people should come to me. And, and you're talking about being, having that willingness to continue growing and to continue learning from other people rather than just, well, I've, I've done it. I've been there. I've done it. Um, now it should all work the way it's supposed to. And as we all know, it never does. No, it does not. Well, Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk to us. And if people do have questions, they want to follow up with you, what's the best way to reach you? Tim, and again, thank you very much for having me. And again, I think these, these conversations about coaching development are, are, are great. Um, the best way to reach me would be by email. That's, that's certainly easy. And I, and I check it as often as possible. And I'm really always willing to help, listen, and uh, and grow. Well, there you have it. And I also want to just thank everybody watching and remind you we have another conversation going on tomorrow. Should be an interesting one. Al Light from Cirque du Soleil will be joining us tomorrow morning. He's a head coach and high performance specialist with Cirque. They have a lot of interesting methods for, for training those guys and well, guys being men and women are very talented athletes. So I'm going to be interested to see whether he is coaching artists to be athletes or does he have athletes he's coaching to be uh, artists. And then, of course, coming up on Friday, Jennifer Hyde, head coach of women's tennis at Florida State, will be talking about her experiences coaching at the collegiate level as well. So my thanks once again to, to Peter and encourage you all, if you haven't yet, just subscribe to the, the YouTube channel so you can catch all of the, the interviews. I know Peter has been watching them. You talked about some of them. So way to plug it, Peter. Uh, but thank you all very much for watching. Tim, thanks again.